Welcome to Pedo Teeth Talk, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, a podcast show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professionals specializing in pediatric dentistry. Thank you for tuning in to Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to you and your practice. Brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Thank you to our Pedo Teeth Talk sponsor, Hugh Freedy, for helping us bring you great content. We couldn't do this without them. Visit them at www.hughfreedy.com. That's H-U-F-R-I-E-D-Y.com. We're here today with Dr. Charlie Serpek. Charlie is a board-certified pediatric dentist in private practice in Chicago, Illinois. He is a partner in Pine Dental Care, a specialty dental practice consisting of four pediatric dentists and two orthodontists. He is an attending dentist at both Lurie's Children's Hospital of Chicago and the Feinberg School of Medicine of Northwestern University. In 2004, he served as the president of the medical dental staff of what is now Lurie's Children's Hospital. That's a major deal that we'll talk about later. In 2012, he was awarded the Oral Health Service Award of the Section on Oral Health of the American Academy of Pediatrics. He currently serves on the Medicaid Advisory Committee and the Safety Committees of both the American Dental Association and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. He is one of the evaluators of the dental home grants of the foundation of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Charlie's stated passion is to bring the best practices and patient safety from medicine into the discipline of pediatric dentistry. In their off times, Charlie and his wife, Mary Ann, enjoy visiting their daughter and her family in Australia. Charlie, it's great to have you here, and today we're going to talk about how to make sure your pediatricians, which you're an expert at talking to, are saying the right things. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Joel, thank you for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here. I'm excited to share some of my experiences about working with pediatricians and pediatric dentists. I think the number one thing, uh, speaking about this, is the word is collaboration. That's right. So we all have... Our, our particular area of expertise, but we're all better when we work together. Absolutely. And I think related to that working together, you know, pediatricians is our topic today, and the goal is how we can make things better, as you just said, how we can care for our patients better together. When I trained, and I know when you trained, clearly the main referral source was pediatricians. I mean, no, you ask anybody, where do you get your patients from? Pediatricians. I think that's not true today. You know, Joel, so I was trained as you were, and the number one thing we would try to do is form a relationship with our local pediatricians. We'd be available to them, and what eventually your goal was to have them say, I take my kids to him or her. Right. And so when they did that, that... that what better of, recommendation than that? Exactly, and it guaranteed, it guaranteed a gateway into your practice. That, I think, is no longer the truth. Um, what happens now, the pediatrician still makes the referral, but then that gets diluted a little bit through social media. So you're, the young parents or families, they'll get that referral, but then they'll check for, they'll go on the internet and they'll check for convenience or programs or things like that. And you look on your schedule and before where you had five patients, now you have four. So what was the pediatrician is now social media. Yeah. In it, terms of referral, social media is the primary. I think yeah, everybody's saying that. Yeah, right? Absolutely correct. so. Our audience knows that. So if, if you don't have <clears throat> yes. if you don't have a vibrant social media presence, you're you're fighting a losing battle. So as we talk about today, Charlie, in our limited time together, I want to bring back that social media twist and the and the, and, and the fact that that is the way that our consumers interact with us and with everything and how that makes this interaction with pediatricians and pediatric dentists more important mm-hmm. and how we do that. So I want to start with what is called the medical home. And we, okay. talk, we talk about the dental home all the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. We know what that is. I think the medical home term was there first, yes. I believe. Mm-hmm. So what, what is a medical home? So a medical home is where a child can get a full evaluation, full treatment, full referral. It doesn't necessarily mean, that, let's say they, they have a surgical procedure. It doesn't mean they're going to have it there. But they have a place to be evaluated. They have a place to have their risk, the risks for their lives assessed. They have a place where people are paying attention to the development of that child. And it can be, in the beginning, it was private practice physicians in their groups. And now it can really be anywhere. So a hospital can be a medical home. Uh, uh, 
an FQHC can be a medical home. And, and I think that's a better way. It, it, this expansion of where a medical home can be has been really m- better for our patients. And one of the things I want to talk about, Joel, is there's a spectrum. When, when people start talking about pediatricians, dentists, you know, there's a spectrum of what a medical home is. There's a spectrum of what a dental home is. Correct. That's and, all changing. It's evolving. Yeah, and, and I think that's part of what we have to pay attention to. But it isn't, in some ways, isn't what the parent says, that's the medical home, and it could be any of the things you mentioned or other it, things. We if, want them to own a place that's owned mutually between the two entities. Part of it is accountability. You, mm-hmm. you want the parent to have a place where the medical decisions are accountable and they, can, and, and they feel comfortable with. And so okay. they're going to search and look for it. I'm going to throw an anecdote here. About 20 years ago, I was at a, one of those strategic planning that institutions and medical schools do. And this very intelligent presentation goes over and the, the, the presenter looks at the doctors in the room, doctors and dentists, and says... The number one reason people are choosing where their health care is, is for convenience. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, 20 years ago, every person in that room rolled their eyes and said, that will never happen. It's right. all about expertise. Right. Now it's convenience. That's why we have practices coming up everywhere. Exactly. Like specific to zip codes or parts of zip codes. And now I'm not going to drive 2.4 miles. I'll drive 2.1 miles. That's exactly Or if, do correct. I have public transportation? All, yeah. So I, I want to come back to the pediatrician and, and creating this interaction. I want to explore that a bit. First of all, very simply, how does a dentist contact a pediatrician? I'm a young dentist. I just started a practice. What do I do? Do I go to the phone book? Do I go to Facebook? Okay. Where, how do I find out who the pediatricians so are around me? The easiest first thing is the most traditional way. You call them up. I want to speak to the office manager. Can I come and visit? I'm a new pediatric dentist. I'm in your area. I'm excited to work with you. So a cold call. Yeah. And and believe it or not, they're used to that. The second way to do it is if you're a hospital-trained pediatric dentist, you're going to go to the hospital meetings, and you're going to put your face there, and you're going to volunteer to be part of that. Another way... A good reason to be involved in the hospitals to continue to be involved. We're going to come back to that, too. Okay. Okay, so um, collaborative care, you, you used that term earlier, that we work together in the best interest. W- what does that really mean in the sense of working with pediatricians? What is collaborative care? What does it look like? So let me tell you what their viewpoint is. So not our viewpoint, but, the, but their viewpoint is they want a specialist or they want a referral or they want to work with somebody who they know that they're going to guarantee a certain level of quality and, and, of, and working with them together. So a a perfect example is uh, every pediatrician is worried about, let's say, something like epidermal dysplasia. So that's a rare disease, right? Right. But they want the pediatric dentist. They, we know about the mouth. We know about those conditions. They want to find somebody who's going to collaborate with them and well, say. The oral manifestations of that yeah. condition are some of the most important manifestations. And, and by the, the way, patient. everybody feels this way. Pediatric dentist, physicians, nobody wants to feel dumb when they're talking to somebody. Right. So one of the things with pediatricians, respect the person asking you a question. Right. You know, I, I see sometimes we tend to say, you know, well, we have all the right answers. Don't even look at it. That, that's not the way you work. Well, the interesting thing is, you know, in thinking about all this, all of us in pediatric dentistry trained with pediatricians during yes. our training. It was a yeah. major part of our training. Mm-hmm. So to lose what was one of the major emphases during the training would be inappropriate. And it's also the greatest opportunity. And that's what you're talking about a- absolutely. today. Absolutely. So, so I want to talk about, you know, you hear integration of medical and dental care. That's a kind of a vogue, you know, we're trying to integrate medicine and dentistry. And, mm-hmm. you know, people talk about it from the healthcare financing standpoint, from integrating pra- FQHCs have done that. What are, what are the implications of that, just talking about it? What does that really mean? Well, so this is a tremendously large topic. So the health home, where dentists and physicians are working side by side, that works best, it seems, in areas like FQHCs or maybe that population where you can, where the dentist and the physicians are side by side and the physicians could say, you know, you're one year old, you just, we just had a well baby care, why don't you just walk over and let the dentist see you? That, right. That's where that works well. But, but usually in, it's ad hoc. Right. It's, it's yeah. not systematic, I find. Is that fair? That's exactly yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. It, and, but there's so many variables of, of how that works. So if you're in a city, 
and there's plenty of pediatric dentists and plenty of physicians, you're probably not going to work in the same environment. You might be close, but you're right. not going to do that. But when we get to rural areas or when we get to where, where high need areas are concerned, right. that's when putting everybody in the same place kind of works because it's hard enough to get a patient, let's say, to the physician for, for vaccinations or something. Let's put our dental offices right there. You know, in some, I'm thinking about this, you know, working with the physicians in a small community, rural community versus a big city. In some ways, it seems like it might be easier in the small community. Because if I'm in a high rise in Chicago here where we are at the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry meeting, and maybe the building I'm in downtown has uh, 15 pediatric dentists in it and 35 exactly. or 40 pediatricians, exactly. it doesn't seem likely I'm going to interact with them automatically. Whereas if I'm in a small town on the countryside, they're all going to know me. Exactly. So, <laughs> so one, of the, one thought that just came to my mind when you were talking about urban settings, the pediatrician wants accessibility. They want to be able to call you anytime. They don't care about your schedule particularly. And they want to say, hey, Joel, I just got this very interesting patient who has this lesion on the lip, and can you take a look at it? And what's your answer? Yes. No matter what your schedule is, when they're yes, referring you're you, available. you say, I am available, send them over, and, and you find and, and, a way. And, and you want a relationship that they would do the same for you. Exactly. That's, that's, the, that's this integration we're talking about. So what are we asking of physicians in this integrated medical dental model? What are we asking them to do in that model? First of all, we're asking them to be aware of the, of the oral cavity. And we're asking them to be aware of risk assessments and, and the different kinds of caries that can exist. The number one first thing we want every physician to do an evaluation is, is the child sleeping with a bottle or are they sleeping with a, on the mother's breast at night? That's the first thing that they need to address. And then if they're not, if they are, they better get them to us right there or they need to find a way to educate the mother so that they don't get early childhood. So I, you and I both, and I've been involved in uh, previous places where there's been a tremendous effort to educate pediatricians, family physicians as well, about oral health, showing them how to do knee to knee exams. And of course, everybody wants to put fluoride varnish on because that's a thing, you know. But the reality is uh, they have 47, I don't know what the number is now, of conditions for which they're assessing some problem during the screening visit at the well baby visit. And how do we get them to add what is, to them is one more thing? Yeah, so that's a big problem. They have the, the um, um, Healthy Children website of the American Academy of Pediatrics tells them what they have to do. They, usually a well child visit takes about eight minutes. They have about 40 things they have to check off. In oral eight minutes. Health, yeah, and, and so oral health becomes like the bottom line on that. On the other hand, as we can increase their awareness, we have to bump up on that list where oral health is. That should be the first or second thing they're checking. Because it's one of the biggest unmet needs. Of course. Yeah, we all, they know that. And I think my experience in, in hearing you say this is they are interested. When we, they, they remind, they go, oh, dental, yes, yeah. Yeah. you're right. Right, right. They don't disagree. No, they don't. We have an audience that's interested. It's not an audience that feels captive. I think it's a... And, and I think you've got to give pediatricians a, a lot of credit for the fact that they are aware of the risks of general anesthesia or of sedation or of early therapy. And they don't want their kids going through that either. But they want their, prevention. their hands are kind of tied because they're, they're trying to go in so many different directions on a well child care visit. For I sure. get it. So we will pause now for a word from our sponsor. Hugh Freedy is the global leader in dental instrument manufacturing and infection prevention solutions that keep you performing at your best. For more information on Hugh Freedy products, visit hughfreedy.com slash AAPD crowns. That's hugh freedycom slash AAPD crowns. And enter the promo code 2682 if placing an order for pedo crowns. I'm here with Dr. Charlie Serpak here in Chicago, Illinois, at the annual session of the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry at the Tech Bar. And we're talking about working with pediatricians, the importance of it, the fact that today uh, the number one source of referrals is coming from social media, not the way it was with pediatricians. Yet, a very important thing for all of us is to work with pediatricians. So we just talked about, Charlie, what the physician's role in trying to raise their awareness about getting oral health at the top of their list so in this model of integrated medical dental, what is our role? I mean, you alluded to that before, but we, we have a specific part of supporting this integrated model. What, what is that? Well, we need to be well-informed. 
We need to think of the child's general well-being also. We should be thinking about the child's BMI. We should be doing risk assessments for behavioral issues. And so it, working interactively, if we both are looking at problems, two eye, four eyes are better than two. So I think that's one of the things as a pediatric dentist we should do. And we, should, we, we shouldn't be cavalier about the relationship. We should respect it. So get back to people. Give them a report. If something's really unusual, make that, you know, make sure that you get the information back to the physician um, in a timely manner. That, yeah. That's the one thing they want for sure. Right. And I, and I think, you know, our mutual experience is we want to show them what we do because we're looking for simple things too. Yeah. We're looking for white spots and, you know, lift the lip and seeing plaque. And they, those are things they can do. And when they realize there are simple things that they may not have been trained in medical school or residency to do that we could show them. Would you agree that I think they want to do it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you got to understand a little of the history. Uh, 20 years ago, they had two lectures on the mouth right. in, in medical school. If that, I'm that, surprised it, they had yeah, yeah, and now it's much, much more. But so many of your older pediatricians, they, they're just willing to say it's a black hole and, you know, take care of it for me, Doc. You know, that's yeah. Right. So you, you and I talked earlier and we were talking about telemedicine because, you know, just as we were saying earlier about some pediatricians are situated in a distant site or close by, but not in, not in physical proximity that's easy. Telemedicine is a thing now. It's a big new thing. And how, how's that going to impact us? And I, just as an example of something that we tried a long time ago, and I want to get your take on telemedicine, is the newborn nursery. Mm-hmm. You know, it's down the hall. It may be in the hospital next door. You know, the ones that I've been in academic health centers may be delivering two, 3,000 babies a year. And a high percentage of them have stuff in their mouth that mm-hmm. needs to be assessed. Most of it, fortunately, is innocuous. Mm-hmm. But we can't station a pediatric dentist there or even a resident all the time. Seemed like that's a great place for telemedicine. It, but that model can be deployed. So I want, I'd like you to tell me and spend some time talking about telemedicine and how it's going to impact all this. Well, first of all, telemedicine is just in its infancy. And, and it has great, great potential for extending the reach of a pediatric dentist. Mm-hmm. So you you can be working with a clinic that's 100 miles away through a, a dentist extender, whatever you want that. Right. It could be a hygienist. It could be uh, a, an assistant. It could be CDHB. And so what you're doing is you're getting real-time feedback to a remote site and hopefully, you know, avoiding big problems before they occur. With interval cameras and exactly. clinical information, other health information. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so... I think there's also, it's going to get to the point where, well, even right now in the modern pediatric office, how many times uh, after hours people are calling your answering service. Right. And and so now we're getting FaceTime, we're getting photos on our phones of what happened. That's that's the beginning of telemedicine. And this is going to grow and grow. I've seen an app. We're here at the trade show floor right now, and I'm going to walk around and see maybe somebody's got an app. I just gave away a good secret maybe. That you can take your phone and put it in your mouth and show your kids trauma, yeah, and they could assess it. I mean, there's got to be a way to capture that stuff. I'm not, you're not making a diagnosis; you're just getting information. We, we, in our practice, this is happening more and more, and it, it also brings some problems with it. You have to worry about the security of the phone and where that goes, HIPAA, and, all that yeah, kind of stuff. Exa- but it is. There is no question in my mind that it will be a significant part of every pediatric office I think within you're right. ten years. And I think. I, I don't know what you're seeing in Illinois, but we're seeing, and I'm seeing in other states, that state boards are now opening up. They're having conversations. Many have already passed legislation mm-hmm. to allow billing for assessments via telemedicine mm-hmm. through different providers. Is that, are you we seeing that here? We just got a code passed in Illinois. To, okay, to, so to, I think, I think it's going to be, a, it's going to sweep the country if, if very quickly because it's the right thing to do. So it, we, have, we should be prepared for all it's this. It's about communication. It's about outreach. And everybody's going to have to figure out how that's going to fit them. I, I, I know some people that are even thinking of doing like the first dental visit by telemedicine rather yeah. than rather than having someone come to your office, just FaceTime with the parents at their house. Because what do we want? We, want, we don't want the bottle in the child's mouth. That, and we can probably work on that particular scenario quite easily without them coming to the office. Yeah, this is really exciting stuff. Another time I want to talk to you more about telemedicine. So I want to shift again to this sort of field of medical dental pediatricians and pediatric dentists and or dentistry and medicine uh, more globally. And, you know, in the state of Oregon recently, they just passed legislation that dentists can give vaccines 
all vaccines, yep. pretty much. Mm-hmm. So I think that's another thing that's going to sweep the country, probably. So what about pediatric dentistry and vaccines or dentistry? Because the laws of state boards are not passed specifically to a specialty. They're to dentistry. So what, what, what can you tell us about that? So that's a, 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 you would always ask a cutting-edge problem that doesn't have an absolute solution. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> um, vaccines, well, let, let's, we know that there's a population in the United States that are not vaccinated. How many of us on our Half health... Half of them in Washington State, by the way. But, but, yeah. Half, how many of us ask <laughs> on our health history, as we did many years ago, what the vaccination status of that child is? So step, that's a step of awareness. Two, yeah, dentists can give the vaccines. I, I think the most, the, you know, the one that fits us the best is HPV because of oral cancer and incorporating that into the dental office. But on the other hand... Do you want to take the responsibility to have the vaccines in your office to make sure that they're, they're um, you know, they're at the right temperature and that they're, you know, you're buying it and so on and so forth? I mean, that's something people got to come to grips with. I think the vaccination and dentist issue is more about creating awareness and then making sure that we protect our patients in our offices. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. So, do you think it's going to happen? Do you think it's going to be universal or do you think it's going to go slowly? I think it's going to go slowly. Mm-hmm. I think I, the, the, I, I flu vaccines in a case of, a, of an epidemic, we dentists should be doing that. Um, if people want to do it on a routine basis, that's, they can choose to do that. If they have a sort of in their mind, they have a dental health home. Right. Um, but us doing MMRs and, you know, the more traditional things, I don't think that's, our, that's where we should go. It's also, you know, maybe... Uh, I'm not going to call it a turf thing. Yeah. But I'm going to say that, you know, there are things that are part of a medical home and for good reason right. in terms of periodicity. Right. And you have to get into those. Stuff. Well, but you're me, right. The flu shot is different. So let me, let, me, let me ask you this question. So a patient comes to my office, right, and they have questionable vaccine status. Where do I go? To make sure that I'm not giving them a double dose of something. Right. And that's one of well, this, this collaboration. This is, this is going on at pharmacies now. Yeah. And yeah. that's, you know, it's pretty much universal, I think, across the country that mm-hmm. pharma- pharmacists are giving. So, yeah, those are questions we won't get into. Thank you, you. You mentioned that. But it's something to look for. Um, well, I'd say to everybody listening to this, I think the first thing we all have to do is we have to go back to determine immunization status for all our patients. And I think this gets back to the uh, electronic health record and the portability of the record and the ability. You know, if everybody were on Epic, yeah. you know, the, you, you, I, just mo- I, I, I just I just moved from uh, uh, Washington down to Arizona and I'll go to the Mayo system and in mm-hmm. 15 seconds the guy had my health record. There you it's go. It's kind of scary in some ways, but amazing mm-hmm. in other ways. And but, it's you know, good. If, if, we, yeah, if we had that in dentistry, it could be mm-hmm. a good thing. And there's some other stuff we'll explore another time about that. Mm -hmm. So when we work together with pediatricians, with physicians, what is the expectation of the physician when working with us? You know, we talked a little bit about that, but I just want to kind of they they want us to be thorough. Mm -hmm. They want us to be well informed. They want us to be motivated. And they and they don't want to hear, you know, they they don't want us to market to them. They want us to be as a service together, working together. They, they want us to be, they, they look at us just like they would look at an ENT doc or, or a rheumatologist. You know, I have a child who has aching joints and I need to get that child to get that fixed. They look at us the same way. I have a child that early child carries. I'm not going to treat it in my office, but I got to get get there right. somewhere. They're the primary care doc and they need a referral. They, they, they need that. Right. We're helping them out. Right. And I think that's the relationship you're trying to build. And, and don't forget, the primary care doc is about assessments. It's, a, it's not about solving problems. It's about identifying problems. And that's a right. different mindset. Yeah, it's a very different thing. So, Charlie, uh, I just want to close with one last question. And in the introduction, I mentioned that you were, on the, you were chief of the staff of this major children's hospital here in Chicago. That's a big deal. And I think, you know, I've been on children's hospital staffs and... You know, there are so many physicians that are vying for those positions, mm-hmm. usually surgeons or maybe active pediatricians. But to have a pediatric dentist, I mean, I, I'm, I'm asking you this for our listeners, especially for our young listeners who want to build their practice based on sure. interaction with pediatricians. It seems like that's a goal. You know, it's an aspirational goal because if you can achieve what you did, and I want to hear about how you did it briefly... Um, that's something that would create well, that interaction. The, tell me about how I, that happened. I, I tell everybody that the experience was my MBA. So I learned about healthcare the hard, the backwards way. Hospitals are uh, a complex organizations. They have a bottom line. 
So they have to be financially solvent, and that enters into every aspect of what a hospital does. Um, and Sounds like us. Not, not to be facetious, <laughs> but one of the things every hospital worries about is a malpractice or a, a bad outcome. And that could cost that hospital millions and millions of dollars. Therefore, we get quality assurance and the push for that. How I did it, I did it by working with people I considered my friends. And I, and I really feel strongly that, that the, the thing that sort of pushed me into that was the fact that they knew, just like the people listening to us because they're taking time out to do this, they care about their kids. And they knew that if they really, and really worked at it, they would do a good job for the kids and then consequently for the professionals around them. That's fantastic. That's a great message. Charlie, I thank you so much for being with me today. There's so much more I want to explore with you other time. I want to thank our audience for tuning into Pedo Teeth Talk, where we bring you the contemporary issues important to you and your practice, brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Thank you to our listeners. We look forward to hearing you next time. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry offers continuing education courses on a wide variety of subjects. Do you sedate children in your office? Attend the safe and effective sedation course. Preparing for your board exam? Attend the qualifying exam prep course. Interested in an overview of the advances in pediatric dentistry? Attend comprehensive review. There are so many ways to earn CE with AAPD. Visit aapd.org for more information. For 10% off of any course, use discount code TEETHTALK when registering. Pedo Teeth Talk is brought to you by the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, the show that delivers cutting-edge ideas for the professional specializing in pediatric dentistry. If you have any questions or comments, please email info at aapd.org. We welcome your ideas for future shows and guests. For more information on the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, visit aapd.org.